Welcome to Good Chris Elfian Talks. I'm Levi. And I'm Chris. And I'm Brian. Thank you for joining us this week. On this podcast, we select one talk a week to help us get the Bible in our daily news feed. We post a new episode at the start of each week with a short intro beforehand to kind of set the stage for the talk you're about to listen to. And now, let's talk more about this week's talk. This week's talk is a midweek class given by Brother Andy Walton um, about this time of year, May 2021. Um, So he gave it on Zoom um, as we were probably still, we were in COVID lockdowns at the time. Um, And this title uh, really struck my eye when it was suggested to us. It was Jesus in Noah's Ark. And um, I had just never heard anything like that, so I was excited to listen to it. And it really uh, was a really, really interesting lecture on essentially kind of the types and symbols of Christ and God's plan for salvation that are in Noah's Ark. Um, There was multiple points that Brother Andy made that were really, really interesting to me. Um, Notes I won't forget. Um, Particularly, actually, was when he got deeper into the number eight. So he did some numerology on the number eight. And when when he first started um, that section, I don't, I'm not kind of quick to ascribe to numerology, but um, he really had some excellent points about the number eight. Um, and there's actually, I went back to look at the YouTube because he had slides, you'll, you'll tell from listening uh, to the class, he has a, a full on slide deck here. And uh, it's minute 35 that he has a particular graph about the number eight. Um, and you'll, you'll notice it just listening when he kind of his final point about the number eight is very striking. Um, but also the last point, uh, kind of detailing about the animals, um, and how I, I, I guess I just never thought about the type of how they are clean and unclean animals and how there's every kind of animal in the ark, meaning that the message of, um, God's salvation given to us through Jesus is for every kind of person, um, in the world. Um, so lots of, lots of really exhortative points. Also, he does do some kind of, uh, more, uh, kind of standard like details about the ark itself, um, which was which was very interesting um, at the beginning. Um, I also really loved the point about um, relating the ark to the tomb, and uh, and God being the one that opened the God being the one that opened the door to the tomb, and um, uh, and open and, and closed the door in the ark. Uh, so fascinating, uh, fascinating class, really happy to share it. Thank you again to the person who sent it in. Um, here is, um, Jesus in Noah's Ark by brother Andy Walton. Okay. Right. Well, evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us in our seminars. For those who are new, just joining in with us this evening, we've been going through, it's a short series of, um, uh, seminars we're running called Jesus in Genesis and we're on the third week at the minute so we're going to be looking at Jesus in Noah's Ark and quite clearly Jesus wasn't physically in Noah's Ark as we've made the point in previous weeks Jesus did not pre-exist in any way he only existed when he was born um, about 2,000 years ago when when Mary gave birth to him he didn't exist before then So you might say, well, why have we got these very strange titles of Jesus in creation and Jesus in Eden and Jesus in Noah's Ark and so on? And what we're trying to establish is that Jesus did exist in the plan and purpose of God. And in God's plan and purpose, he actually talks about Jesus, sometimes in a very uh, prophetical way, specifically talking about what he was going to do. And in sometimes he speaks about Jesus in a symbolic way. And what we're going to see tonight is that God talks about Jesus in relation to Noah's Ark specifically. And we're going to make prove that point. So we're going to absolutely prove that uh, we're not just making this up. We're not going to try and stretch anything here. I'm going to show you that the New Testament says that Jesus was Uh, something to do in a symbolic sense with Noah's Ark. So that's what we're going to do this evening. I've been working on this for a couple of weeks. And to be honest, I hope you get some of the 
absolute wonder of, of this because I've been totally and utterly blown away with um, just how many links there are between Jesus and the events of Noah building the ark and so on. I'm really hoping I can get that across to you this evening. If I don't, then I'm sorry, but I've just been mesmerized by it. So um, so let's just crack on then. First of all, just to um, explain when Noah's ark was actually happening, you can actually work out roughly when the flood happened because of genealogies that were given in Genesis itself and you can sort of work out when people were born and and when they had their children and so on and so forth we're not going to look at that uh, this evening but you can work out that in fact the um, the flood happened about one and a half thousand years after creation so just take my word for that just just for now but you can actually work that out and working backwards, therefore, we can work out that the flood happened, give or take some years, but 4,365 years ago, give or take, as I say, is when the flood actually happened. And we're not going to look tonight at the evidence that there was a worldwide flood, but there is evidence that there was a worldwide flood. Um, so this isn't a study on... Um, you know, that side of things, we're looking at Jesus basically in Noah's Ark in symbolic type. What is really amazing though, in recent years, and I think this goes back to about 2014, I was reading in the Daily Telegraph, uh, Noah's Ark would have floated even with 70,000 animals. And uh, the some scientists at the University of Leicester actually modelled Noah's Ark and calculated how many animals could he get on the Ark. So they worked out the dimensions, they worked out the average size of each animal, and so on and so forth. And they calculated that, that, that 70,000 animals could have easily uh, got onto the Ark. They even worked out uh, the tonnage of those animals, so how heavy would all that have been? How heavy would the ark, of, ark have been? Um, the ark could have carried, believe it or not, 24,000 tonnes of people, animals, whatever. And um, as it says there, Noah's ark would have floated even with two of every animal in the world packed inside, scientists have calculated. Uh, they also look to see, because um, clearly they've got to take, God says, take two of every species of, of, of animal on the ark. And, and part of the calculations were, well, what species, how many are we talking about? And um, they, they've worked it out because you don't need to take every single type of dog, for instance, on, on the ark, because as we know, and Janet knows better than all of us that you know dogs can develop over time they're still a dog but uh, different breeds can come over time anyway they they calculated that it would have been less than 8600 birds on the ark less than 6300 reptiles less than 3700 mammals and less than two and a half thousand um, amphibians so in all there was around about 21,000 um, animals, individual animals. So there's two of each kind. So there's around about 40, 42,000 animals would have gone onto the ark. And as I say, the scientists at Leicester University in 2014 calculated it could have carried easily 70,000 animals so, and birds and, and so on. So there was plenty of room on the ark to um, accommodate everything that needed to be accommodated and have room for food and have room for water, which is pretty amazing. They also calculated whether Noah would have had long enough to build this thing. And we're going to look in a minute at uh, some people in Kentucky who've actually built a model replica of the Ark, and we'll see a bit of video of that in just a second. 
And anyway, there was lots and lots of calculations done on, on this and how much wood you'd have to cut and how long it would take to plane it and how many hours and how many days and so on and so forth. And they calculated that um, if Noah and just his sons, so there was only the, the four of them, there were three sons plus Noah, and they worked a certain number of hours a day and so on and so forth, they could have completed the whole arc in 65 years, which seems an incredible length of time to build one boat, but we'll see the size of it in just a second. But of course, the Bible indicates that they had 120 years to build the ark, because don't forget, they lived a long, long time back in the days of Noah. So they lived over 900 years back then. So 120 years to build the ark, we've calculated, or the scientists have calculated, it, it probably would have taken 60 five years so about half of that time again there's plenty of time to have built the ark and here's a, a picture of this isn't the whole ark they couldn't even get it on the the whole screen on this particular shot but this if you went to kentucky you could be part of the millions of people that are going each year to go and see a replica of the ark and actually go on it and walk around it it's a 100 million pound um, exhibition. It's, a, it's an incredible, incredible thing that they've um, built. And uh, it opened in 2016. So it's only very recently opened. It actually made headline news at the time. And I'm just gonna play you a very short little clip of this replica of Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark is standing tall again this morning in central Kentucky. What some call the greatest story ever told is now shared in this massive replica. But after two years of construction, it is both a Christian theme park and a lightning rod for critics. Mark Strassman is at the Ark in Williamstown, Kentucky, where crowds are pouring in for a glimpse. Mark, good morning. Good morning. If the ark behind me seems larger than life, well, that is the whole idea. Nothing like it has ever been built before, but critics wonder why it was ever built at all. This is the Ark Encounter, a chapter from Genesis told on a $100 million budget. Four floors of Noah, his family, and beasts, great and small. In this rendition, they sail first class through the watery chaos outside. And seeing it is a privilege and a pilgrimage to the DeMarcus family. What are your first impressions? This is breathtaking. It's amazing. The detail, just even outside, as soon as we walked up, it's just draw dropping. This timber frame arc was built with help from 100 Amish craftsmen, following specs straight from the pages of Genesis. It stands seven stories tall and runs 510 feet long. That's almost two football fields. Something to consider. This ark's Christian backers consider themselves young earth creationists. That means evolution, junk science. The earth is only 6,000 years old. Do you believe there were dinosaurs and people at the same time? Absolutely. Yep, I absolutely do. I believe they walked hand in hand. Ken Ham, the ark's 64-year-old visionary, make yourself an ark, leads a ministry called Answers in Genesis. The truth is the word of God. And we are faithfully, as faithfully as we can, representing what God's word teaches. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? This guy who put this whole project together is called Ken Ham. And one of the sons of Noah was, uh, was, of course, Ham. And there's this guy in these last days building this incredible um, ark, two football fields long it is. It's absolutely incredible. And it's worth watching more video of this to just see the scale and size of it and they've made replicas of all the animals that would have gone uh, into the ark anyway right so I just thought I'd show you that just to uh, just to show you what we're talking about here it's just absolutely incredible thing in fact right now that boat in Kentucky is the largest wooden frame structure in the whole world right now there's nothing bigger as a wooden frame structure anywhere um, in, in the world. So that just shows you the size of it. In fact, there wasn't a boat built bigger than the Ark until 1884 when one of Brunel's ships was, was made and that was bigger 
than the ark. So for thousands of years, four and a half thousand years, the, the ark was in fact the biggest boat ever built. Now, I said to you earlier on that the New Testament links the ark with Jesus Christ. And that's what I want to quickly show you. So in 1 Peter chapter 3, it tells us these amazing words because it says, and this is verse 18, for Christ also died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God being put to, get, put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were saved through, or some versions say by water, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a clear conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So what we're being told here is, is that this building of the ark and the saving of the eight people through water is the equivalent of baptism today. And baptism, as we know, is the full immersion of somebody underwater and then coming back up out of the water again. So we're not making this up when we say that there's a clear link between what what was happening with the ark and what baptism is. And we're going to see in a second that baptism is all about Jesus Christ. Okay, so that's what we're going to have a quick look at. But I just want to point something out really weird, because do you notice there that it says eight persons were saved through water, or if you've got another translation, it will say by water. And you say to yourself, well, that's weird, because they weren't saved through water. They weren't saved by water. They were saved by the building of the ark. Why does it say they were saved through water? Because they weren't. Um, And I puzzled over this uh, just for a few minutes. That's me looking a bit puzzled. And here is the answer. So as I say, uh, the authorised version says eight people were saved by water. And the, as an example, the New International Version says eight people were saved through water. But actually, it isn't a great translation on either of them. What it actually should say, and actually m- many times it's translated, this word by or through is translated as because. It really should say eight people were saved because of the water or eight people were saved on account of the water in other words what it's really saying is god saved noah because of the flood wasn't that the water saved them at all the water brought great death god saved noah because of the water because of the flood god knew the flood was coming and he told noah what to do to escape the flood it was the ark that saved them wasn't the water that saved them at all it was the ark that saved them the ark is the critical thing and that's why it mentions the ark specifically in that one peter chapter three right so look at this now when i put this imagery together which we're going to start off simple and build some amazing imagery here so i'm hoping i can do this and I'm really hoping it makes sense. So we know the flood is all about water. We know that baptism is all about water. So there's a whole bunch of water. We've got the flood on the left and we've got baptism on the right. And as we've said, those two things are clearly linked in one piece, chapter three. Now, normally I do this a bit interactive, but everybody's sort of muted. So I'm gonna just keep rattling through this. If I was to ask you, what was the water all about at the time of the flood? What was the water going to do? And the answer is, the water of the flood was going to do two things. It was going to bring death according to God, and it was going to remove wickedness according to God. God says, I'm going to flood the world Um, because the world is just so wicked and I'm going to destroy every living thing 
on the earth. That is precisely uh, what, it, what it says. Uh, Genesis 6, verse 13, the earth is filled with violence through the people on the earth, says God, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And he says, I will bring this flood. So the water that God um, poured out on the earth was to remove wickedness and to bring an immense amount of death. Now, if I was to say to you, the water with baptism, what is that all about? When we are actually baptised, what is the water? When we go under the water, when we're physically baptised and our whole body goes under the water as, a, as an adult, what does that actually represent? And it actually represents two things. The first thing it represents is the death of Christ. And the second thing is, it's the removing of wickedness or sin. And to prove that to you, in Romans chapter 6, verse 3, it says, don't you know that so many of us as were baptised into Jesus Christ were baptised into his death? You notice it doesn't say into his life. We're baptised. When we go under the water, when we're baptised, it's a pretend death, really. Jesus went through a proper death, a terrifyingly awful death because he was nailed to the cross. And we're told in Romans that when you go under the water, baptism is symbolic of you dying in the same sort of way that Jesus died. We're associating ourselves with his sacrifice. I mean, fortunately for us, God has said, do something ever so simple and straightforward, go into the water. And that is exactly like Jesus being crucified for your sins. And I will give you the sacrifice of Jesus into your own personal formula, if you like. The other thing it says about baptism in Acts 22, verse 16, is that baptism washes sins away. Be baptized and wash your sins away. So the water involved with baptism is all to do with Jesus's death and removing sins and the flood and the water there was all to do with death and the re removing of wickedness so you can see why Peter links these two things together but here's the amazing thing because all that's about death isn't it but Noah didn't die he was saved and what saved him was a floating box that's pretty much what it was. I know the model that we've just seen that they've built had got sort of um, a stern and it, it, it's almost got like a rudder thing coming out the back. Probably didn't have that because God didn't need to steer it. It was just a floating, enormous two field, football field long box. So there's that floating box and that's what saved Noah. He had got the faith to not be under the water he got the faith to get on board that boat now of course Jesus when he died on the cross didn't stay dead either did he um, Jesus was raised from the dead after three days and three nights and in fact um, what happened was he came out of the tomb so he was put in the tomb after he died and after three days and three nights on, on the Sunday morning, first day of the week, out he comes. And the stone was rolled away and, and he came out of the tomb uh, to life again. Just have a if you're in Genesis. Um, if you if you have a look in Genesis chapter six, I don't know if it is chapter six, actually. Uh, yeah, sorry, it's Genesis chapter 8, verse um, 18. In Genesis chapter 8, verse 18, it talks about Noah going forth with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him and all the beasts and creeping things and fowls and whatsoever that creep upon the earth after their kinds, they went forth out of the ark. So Noah began a new life, didn't he, when he came off, off the ark? There was a new beginning for Noah, a new life. 
really in a new world at that point, because when the art came to rest on Ararat that we'll look at in a minute, it was a brand new beginning and a brand new life. And of course, Jesus began a brand new life, really, when he was raised from the dead because he was made immortal. But the wonder of it all is that when you look at baptism, it has exactly the same themes in relation to baptism. In Romans chapter 6, verse 4, it says, when you've been baptized, we then also walk in a new life. So when we've been baptized and our sins have been washed away, um, we're told by the Apostle Paul in the letter to the Romans that that's like a new life. And in fact, the next verse, verse 5 says that just as Jesus was raised from the dead, so also we will be in the likeness of his resurrection as well. So he basically says, look, if you've been baptized, you, amazingly, are going to be resurrected if you die before Jesus gets back in just the same way that Jesus was raised from the dead. So baptism is a little symbolic picture of exactly what Jesus went through, his death and his resurrection and we are baptized into his death and then we walk a new life. And if we die beforehand, it doesn't matter because when Jesus gets back, we're going to walk a new life. Can you see how all these things uh, link together? So here's somebody being baptized. Can you see that little person that's flicked onto the screen there? So when you're baptized, you go right under the water in like a big bath. We've baptized people in hot tubs and uh, baths and under the stage at, uh, at, at Pershaw meeting, there was a proper bath dug under the, the platform at the front. But of course, the person doesn't stay underwater. We lift them up out of the water and they begin this new life with their sins forgiven. So that is why Peter links these things together. But you know something? Now, can you see something quite weird here that the arc on the left there with the door in the side looks a little bit similar to the grave, the tomb that's been opened when Jesus walked out of the tomb. Can you see this sort of look a little bit similar? And when I put these two images on the screen, I had no idea at the time that they were going to look the same. I just found two images, I put them on the screen. And I was just staring at them thinking, these two things are remarkably the same. And here's something else really amazing. Because in Genesis chapter 7, verse 16, we're told specifically that when Noah got on board the ark with all the animals, it says that the Lord shut him in. It literally means that God sealed him in. So Noah didn't shut the door and sort of pull it to. God shut the door and he sealed it. Now, there's a very, very important reason why God did that. If you imagine Noah's built this enormous, enormous ark, enormous boat made out of wood. And in the side of it, we're told, he puts a door. Now, this door is also made out of wood. And yeah, he covered it in pitch and all the rest of it. But... Basically, this was the weakest point on the whole of this ark, wasn't it? If any water got through any part of that door, that boat would start to sink categorically. Now, in modern boats, we've got, we used to hydraulic systems that were, you can, you can sort of turn great big wheels and completely seal um windows and doors that were under the water but you imagine trying to do that out of wood that slightly twists and bends it would have been nigh on impossible for Noah to seal that door to the extent that not a speck of water would have got in and you might have said well perhaps the door would have floated above the the surface of the water but you know something it wouldn't because they've calculated how low the ark would have sunk in the water with around about 20,000 tons of animals on that ark. And it would have sunk very, very, very low in the water indeed. It wouldn't have gone 
under, it would have floated, they've calculated that, but it would have been very low in the water. And it doesn't matter which story they had built the door in the side of the ark on, it would absolutely have gone under the water line. So the door itself was under the water line, which was why it was that God sealed the door to stop water getting in. You can imagine, can't you, that if there was any slight chink, the slightest chink at all, and water was coming in, it would have been impossible to bail the water out because you've got to run at four stories with a or three stories with a bucket to empty it out the top to run back down. And eight people could never, ever have emptied the ark of water. So God sealed the door. But then you come to the resurrection of Jesus Christ when he walked out of. Well, what did he walk out of? In Matthew chapter 28, verse 2, it says that the angel of the Lord came and rolled back the stone from the door. So basically, we're told that the entrance to the tomb was like a door. And the very and just a few verses later, we're told that Pilate asked for the stone to be sealed. So this was a sealed stone across the mouth of the tomb where Jesus was lying completely dead. And an angel of the Lord comes and unseals that door, rolls a stone back, and Jesus comes out blinking into the sunlight. And so what we've got is Noah in the Old Testament, walking onto the ark, God seals the door. In the New Testament, we've got Jesus coming out and, this, and the doorway is unsealed and walking out immortal is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amazingly as well, I mean, this was starting to blow my mind, really, looking at all this imagery. In John chapter 10, verse 9, Jesus says, I am the door. By me, if any man enters in, he will be saved. And look what it says, and shall go in and out and find pasture. And I've read this verse, I can't begin to tell you how many thousands of times. And I've never thought about the going in and out. What Jesus is saying is, just as Noah went in to the ark, where he was safe for a short period of time, Eventually, you're going to come out blinking into the sunlight. Really, that floating boat is almost a little bit like the tomb that Jesus was in. They were as good as dead, really, in that tomb. They were floating probably under the waterline. When they were inside the ark, they were almost under the water. But God was protecting them. He didn't suffer them to see any corruption at all. They didn't die. And then when the ark finally landed, the door was opened and out they came. They went in and they came out. Jesus went into the tomb dead. He came out 100% alive and immortal. It's incredible how all this imagery links together. And of course, one day the ark landed on Mount Ararat and the door was opened and out Noah came into this beautiful sunshine. I don't know what the world would have looked like, to be perfectly honest, when Noah came out. It probably didn't look totally brilliant because the world had been flooded for uh, many, many, many months. But either way, he's now out this pitch black ark that he was inside with all these animals smelling and bleating and barring and whatever else they did. And out he comes into a brand new world, just him and his family to repopulate the world. Jesus came out of the tomb. Well, we know he came out into a garden. Um, Mary Magdalene, who saw Jesus as he came out of the tomb, thought he was the gardener. He came out into a beautiful garden. And again, it was a brand new life for him. And it was all about Jesus then beginning effectively his job of bringing more and more people to eternal life as well to start a brand new life with him but many many years into the future in in the coming kingdom of God but can you see how these things link 
in Genesis chapter 8, verse 18, we've read this. Noah went forth and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing and every fowl and whatsoever creeped upon the earth, after their species, after their kinds, they went forth out of the ark. I mean, how amazing is this? What, from the darkness and despair of being inside the ark, because it wasn't the happy, lovely place. It was pitch black. It would have been a, well, it might not have been pitch black. Who knows? They might have had a few candles in there. I don't know. But it certainly was not a pleasant place to be in. To then walk out into a world restored, well, it's an incredible thing. And there we are. There's Jesus. Took him down from the tree, laid him in a sepulchre, but God raised him from the dead. Um, I'm going to show you some more. St I mean, honestly, I could talk all night about this, but I'm going to get through some of these other things, because once you start understanding that the ark and the flood are related to Jesus and his sacrifice, there's amazing things that come out before your eyes. Let me just deal with a few of these. One of them is that God rescued eight people. So he rescued Noah and his wife. He rescued Shem, Ham and Japheth and their wives. So there was eight people. Now, eight in the Bible is symbolic of a new beginning. And we know that because there are there were six days that God made the world and everything in it. And on the seventh day, he rested. Therefore, the eighth day became the first day of a new week, a new beginning. So eight in the Bible is symbolic of a new beginning. And that's why there were eight people that came off the ark. It was a, a new beginning. Let me just show you how that links to Jesus, because I don't know whether you're aware of this. I'm sure you probably are. But the, in the Greek, well, and in the Hebrew for that matter, but in the Greek alphabet, every single letter has got a number. So you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, then then it goes up in tens, then it goes up in, a hun in, in hundreds, okay? So that is the numerology of the Greek um, alphabet. And if you look at the name of Jesus in the Greek, that's exactly how it is spelt. Um, and each of those letters has got a number, 10, 8, 200, 70, 400, and 200. And if you add those numbers together... Jesus's name in the Greek, the name Jesus, adds up to 888, uh, which is sort of quite amazing when you think that eight is all about a new beginning. And here is Jesus as the new beginning that we are baptized into. He is the new beginning for all of us. And if it ended there, you might say that's a coincidence. If you look at the name Christ, it's got the value of 1,480 in the Greek, which is eight times 185. If you look at the value in the Greek of saviour, another name for Christ, it's 1,408, which is eight times 176. Lord is 800, eight times 100. Messiah is 656, eight times 82. Son of man is 2,960, eight times 370. And Jesus Christ, so his full name, if you like, is 2,368, which is eight times 296. The chance of all the titles of Jesus adding or being divisible by eight is calculated as one in nine billion. So mathematicians can calculate the odds of that happening. You only need one number adrift and suddenly it isn't divisible by eight. It is a mathematical impossibility that God did not design this and that all titles of Jesus are divisible by the number eight. Eight is all to do with Jesus. It's a new beginning and there were eight people on the ark. Another thing that I was looking into is this uh, gopher wood because we told the ark was built of gopher wood. Now, I'm going to suggest to you that because there's lots written about, well, what was gopher wood? Nobody knows what gopher wood. Is it cedar? Is it oak? Is it some sort of, what sort of tree is it? Interestingly, if you look at one of the very original Bibles written in English, the Wycliffe Bible, J 
Genesis chapter 6, verse 14, that in our version says, go for wood, it doesn't say go for wood. It says, make thou a ship for thyself out of hewn and planed wood. So Wycliffe translated gopher as hewn and planed wood. He also translates it um, in 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 33. God that has girded me with strength and had, has made plain my perfect way. That's basically basically somebody's planed you, i.e., you know, if you've actually got um, uh, a chisel. A chisel will plain wood. It removes all the gnarly bits. It removes all the rough bits. It's planed wood. It can also be squared wood as well. So planed and squared wood. When Ham, the Ken Ham, who made the ark in Kentucky, if you read about how they put it together, they researched how in ancient times after the flood, people made boats. And he says that they made it out of square wood that was planed. He doesn't refer anything to gopher wood. He just says that we made the ark. Our replica of the ark was made out of planed and square wood, which is exactly what Wycliffe says gopher means. Now, in terms of that, of course, this makes you think a little bit about Jesus. Um, Phil Flanagan, uh, who's, uh, I think, listening in right now, often says in his prayers about us having the the rough bits taken off us and us being, you know, sort of squared up, basically. We know that Jesus is the chief cornerstone. He is the perfect square shape. And we are aligned perfectly to that cornerstone. And therefore, isn't it interesting, perhaps, that the wood that Noah used was plain, perfectly and smoothly and squared so that everything fitted together just exactly like Jesus wants us to be. Uh, we've talked about the door being shut and sealed by God. What's this thing about rooms? Because we read in uh, Genesis chapter 6 that um, God told Noah, make an ark of gopher wood, or maybe it means planed and squared wood. And then it says, rooms shalt thou make in the ark. So there were three decks in the ark we're told and on those three decks there were rooms that were built and um they they weren't huge rooms i don't think i think they were actually quite small rooms and the reason that i think that is because this word room if you look in your bible in your central margin it actually means in the hebrew nests in fact, it's translated as nests elsewhere in the Old Testament. So they've called it rooms in, in, in this particular verse. But as I say, it really means nests. We know what lives in nests. Living in nests are very small, young birds. That's what, that's what lives in nests. It's the young. And I think it's a reference here to it wasn't adult animals that Noah brought onto the ark. It was young animals. I mean, if you're going to try and pack uh, 21,000 animals on, into an ark, even though there's lots of space, why would you take a fully grown elephant? Ele not an elephant, an elephant. Why would you take a fully grown giraffe? You wouldn't. You would take a young giraffe. You'd take a young elephant. You'd take a young sheep. You'd take a lamb, wouldn't you? Because that reduces the weight right down uh, in the ark and also how much they need to eat and drink. So there were all these small rooms. And when you look at what um, Ken Ham built in Kentucky, there's thousands and thousands of these small two foot by two foot um, cages that they've built, as well as some bigger rooms for the larger animals. Uh, they calculated that the average size of all animals came out at smaller than a, than a small sheep. Right. So you could get all of these creatures into fairly small spaces. Interestingly, thinking about this ark being full of rooms in the Revised Standard Version in John chapter 14, verse two, Jesus said, in my father's house are many rooms. If it was not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? 
Uh, some people use this verse to say, well, when we die, we go to heaven because it says in my father's house are many rooms and I'm going to prepare a place for you there. But Jesus isn't talking about heaven. Every single reference in the New Testament to my father's house is not a reference to heaven. It's a reference to the temple. Jesus was talking about the temple where they worship God. And if you think about the temple, all of the temple and the worship of God is actually all about God dwelling one day on earth with man. And that's going to be at the end of the millennium when Jesus has set up the kingdom. So Jesus isn't saying that we're all flying off the heavens to live in a room up in heaven. He's basically saying there's plenty of room for everybody in the future kingdom that is going to come on this earth. And I'm preparing that for you. How? Because, well, I'm going to uh, be sacrificed so that your sins can be forgiven and you can one day walk out of the tomb, out of that horrible door where you've been locked away in a tomb into the bright light of a future wonderful kingdom. We're told in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 5 that Jesus is building a spiritual house. We're all part of this house that God is building of people who accept him and ultimately are saved through the sacrifice of, of Jesus. What about pitch? Because if you notice in Genesis chapter 6, again in verse 14, we, we told quite a lot here, aren't we? In Genesis 6 verse 14, Noah was told, make an ark of gopher wood, rooms or nests shall you make in the ark, and you, you're going to pitch it within and without with pitch. And this means like a, a tar-like substance. So God says you better cover it with some tar-like substance within and without, because obviously you don't want any leaks. So Noah probably didn't use a paintbrush like that, but he would have painted with something, the whole lot of it in some tar-like substance. And you might say, well, has this got anything to do with Jesus? Because it looks like everything else has. Well, here's something amazing. They are two different Hebrew words there in that same verse. When it says you're going to pitch it within, without, with pitch, the first word for pitch is the Hebrew word kafar, and the second word for pitch is the Hebrew word kofa. The Hebrew word for kafar means atonement. In fact, every single time in the Hebrew, in the Old Testament, that word kafar is translated as atonement 72 times, only once is it translated as pitch, and that's in this verse right here. The Hebrew word for kofa is the word for ransom, and it's translated 12 times in the Old Testament as ransom, and once in this verse as pitch. When you come to the New Testament, you find that these two words are associated 100% with Jesus. In Romans chapter 5, verse 11, it says, Jesus Christ, by whom we have received, well, 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 the atonement. You see, an atonement is, if you look at the word atonement, it literally means at one -ment. It means to become one with God. And the way that we become one with God is by being covered, having our sins covered, basically, and that's why atonement is the word that's used for the covering of sin. In 1 T Timothy chapter 2, verse 6, it says, Jesus Christ gave himself as a ransom for all. Isn't that incredible? So Jesus has paid the price for our sin. So our sins are very, very expensive because we're sinning. We're not doing what God wants and Jesus has paid the ransom bill, and he paid it through his sacrifice. Do you know something? If the ark wasn't covered in pitch, it would have sunk, wouldn't it? It doesn't matter how tight he would have got those planks of wood. If it wasn't covered in pitch, 
that ark would have sunk, which is why God said, put it in and out. Do you know something? If we're not covered with the sacrifice of Christ, we spiritually are sunk. We have got no hope. Sin will get into our lives and it will cause our own boat to sink. We're in all sorts of trouble. We need baptism to protect us to, to that extent. Animals, well, we know the animals were taken clean and unclean animals were taken onto the ark. There were two of each type of unclean animal. So there was a male and a female of everything that was unclean. When it comes to the clean animals, they took seven animals. So there were, there were uh, three pairs of clean and an extra male animal was taken in. So there were seven in total. They didn't take 14 clean animals in. They took in seven, three pairs of clean animals, and there was one extra animal. And I'll tell you what they did with that extra animal that they took in in just a second. So, yeah, that's what this is saying. There was two two of every unclean and seven of clean animals. Now, there aren't that many clean animals because you might say, oh, crumbs, if they've got to take in seven of everything that's clean, that's an enormous number of extra animals. Do you know something? There's only about 30 clean animals and birds mentioned in the Old Testament. So there were 30 of them out of all those thousands you know, 20,000 species of animal, there was only around about 30 that were classified as clean by God. And there were seven of each of those. Uh, and all the others, there were, there were, there were two of them. Um, now, you might say, well, what do all these animals represent? They're all going on the ark, clean and unclean. Do they represent anything? And the answer is they do. Because all those animals of all their different shapes and sizes represent people. We know, of course, there was only eight real people on board the ark. But all these clean and unclean animals are representing all of us that can be saved on board HMS Noah's Ark. Um, in Acts chapter 10, verse 28, in the NIV, it says, um, he said to them, you're well aware that it's against our law for a Jew to associate or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean because the Jews considered Gentiles to be unclean. A Gentile is a non-Jewish person, right? So Gentiles, in fact, all the way through the Old Testament, Gentiles are called unclean. Jews, by inference, are clean. What we're being told is here that on board the ark were not just clean animals, but unclean. They were Jew and Gentile effectively saved by the ark. But the ark really was just a very tiny symbol of the work, the future work of Jesus. When Jesus, through his sacrifice, was going to save both Jew and Gentile. Which brings me, you might be glad to know, because I've gone over a few minutes, but it brings me to the very last element here that I'm going to talk about. And there's a lot more we could. And that is this, that the Ark of Noah landed on a mountain. And that there on the left hand side of those images is the mountain of Ararat. As it's on the world, that's exactly what Mount Ararat looks like today. If you wanted to go and see it, that's what it would look like. And I've just put on the very top of that um, a tiny not to scale picture of an ark that's come to rest on the very top of that mountain. And if you come and have a look at Genesis chapter eight, because of the, uh, the words aren't quite on the screen there. In Genesis chapter eight, verse 18, it says that Noah went forth and his sons and his wife and his son's wives with him. This is landed on Ararat. They're now coming out of the door. And verse 20 said, and Noah builded an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Do you know what he did? 
he took the seventh animal, the seventh clean animal. That's why there were three pairs of clean and the seventh one, the seventh male was sacrificed to God of every clean animal. So there were about 30 or so sacrifices that took place of the seventh animal. It was the, it was really a, a link back to creation where God made the world in six days. And on the seventh day, it was a day holy and special to God. And the seventh animal was sacrificed. And that's what took place on top of that mountain as Noah came off looking at this brand new world. And do you know something? When Jesus gets back and the dead are raised and they walk out of their individual tombs, as it were, and are brought back to life, and they stand there blinking, looking at this incredible world that um, is, is going to be put right by, by Jesus during his millennial reign as king on earth. There is going to be a mountain. Um, it says in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2 to 4, that in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be the highest of all, the most important place on earth. It will be raised above the other hills and people from all over the world will stream there to worship. And the worship of God will take place on top of that new mountain that is there in Israel. It will be in Jerusalem. That's Jerusalem will be raised up like an enormous mountain and a great temple will be built to God and God will be worshipped there. And all people of all the world will flow into that mountain to learn about God and of his ways and be taught by Jesus. It's exactly the same image, really, but in a very poor and tiny way of the ark landing on Ararat and Noah worshipping God and sacrificing those animals. There's more that could be said. I've just really scratched the surface of looking at Jesus in Noah's ark, but hopefully you found enough there to find that interesting and maybe you can go and look yourselves at other things that, that are there. I don't think we're stretching it at all. I think all of these things have been there by design and are there to show us that God knew exactly what was coming and that Jesus himself was the answer uh, to all of our hopes and all of our prayers. So I know I've gone on. Thank you for listening to the Good Christadelphian Talks podcast. We hope this talk helped you in your walk. If you would like to hear more, please subscribe for new episodes and leave a review in Apple Podcast or whichever service you are using to help more people find the show when they search for it. If you enjoyed this particular talk, please share it with someone who you think might enjoy it as well. For show notes on the talk you just listened to, visit our show page at anchor.fm slash GCT or check the show notes section of your podcast player. Please share your thoughts on the talk from this week on our Facebook or Instagram pages, where we are at Good Christadelphian Talks, on Twitter, where we are at GCT underscore podcast, or leave a comment on our YouTube channel where these talks are posted as well. If you know of a great talk, we want to know about it too. Send a suggestion to our email at goodchristadelphiantalks at gmail.com or message us on any of our social media accounts. Thank you for listening. God bless and talk to you next week.